Wheel of Time is uh, probably what Tolkien was to my dad's generation. I think it was to me. Um, I had read The Lord of the Rings, and then I think afterwards I read um, everything David Eddings wrote that was available at the time. And I guess I was just at the right age. I was probably 14 or 15 or something like that um, to sort of tackle something really thick. And um, <laughs> I think I was on some sort of fantasy uh, fantasy bulletin board, you know, back in the days before the internet when you would log on to a BBS. And so I lived in a pretty small town, so we were just, I was just talking with you know, other people in the area, and everyone was like, oh, you have to read The Eye of the World, you have to read The Eye of the World. And, uh, and I did, and I was, I was just completely hooked, completely hooked. To be honest, I think I was a little, I was a little scared, probably. <laughs> just because I, I have a real... Um, emotional attachment to the series and you know sometimes that sort of a, you know, a emotional distance between the project um, and yourself is great because you can you're sort of a little more free to think about the the artwork graphically and what, what's going to work well as a picture but um, you know for some for a series that I know so well and have so much uh, you know, emotional attachment to it was just um, a little overwhelming because I knew all the characters and I knew um, you know where they were headed as characters, um, and how to separate sort of my idea of what they what they were and what they became from what it is that you're able to make in a picture. Um, that, that was sort of a scary prospect. I don't know. I got over that pretty quick though. It was exciting. I've always really liked Matt, so it seemed like a really good excuse to to paint him. Um, and you know, such an interesting turning point for him because he goes from sort of being this. Uh, I guess, well, he's not directionless, but he goes from being a slightly sort of, you know, he's just sort of tagging along and being dragged dragged along almost against his will um, to really sort of being thrown in the middle of some some big stuff, you know, especially when he goes uh, through the twisted terangrils. I'm going to mispronounce <laughs> I'm going to mispronounce all the words. Um, but when he meets, you know, the Aelfin and the Aelfin and, and uh, he gets the memories and all this sort of stuff, he really, he turns from... You know, an interesting secondary character to someone who I felt was really worth paying attention to. Um, and I had never read anything you know, like this, some character with the implanted memories of these other you know, dead generals. So, so fantastic. It's pretty basic. I, it's just watercolor and acrylic on paper. And I, I like to mix the two because uh, the acrylic is permanent. And so you can get some sort of substantial value right away um, without having to build it up slowly. And then you have a like a nice medium or dark tone that you can sort of paint the other transparent washes around. Um, I'm friends with uh, Dan DeSantos, and uh, so he invited me up to Connecticut. He knows this old illustrator, this fantastic um, illustrator, Ed Babel, who has this wonderful costume collection. He's just a real interesting character. You know, he was an illustrator in World War II, and he did location drawings at the Nuremberg Trials, I think, and just this really amazing stuff. And after um, he finished, his stint with the army, he got a job doing the history of war for National Geographic, which involved him collecting all this fantastic costuming. And so uh, Dan and I went over to his place and picked out some some stuff. Uh, Matt has a pretty specific look, you know. He's always got the woolen coat and and things like that. Uh, you know, what's so interesting about Robert Jordan is that there's no um, there's no Japan with the serial numbers filed off, or there's no <laughs> Ireland but called something different, you know, it really, the nations and the cultures really feel uh, like unique creations. And so, um, you know, as an artist, I think that really freed me up to kind of costume Matt however I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to stay true to what the descriptions were, but um, as far as the cut and the styling, you know, Jordan's great, he never really, um, you know, forced a specific vision on anyone, I don't think. So, um, we actually based his coat off of a Civil War jacket, um, which I thought was sort of fitting because he sort of turns into this great, general himself. So as far as the elements that, you know, that I tried to put into the picture, it's basically just Matt standing in front of the Tree of Life, which uh, he, man, this is, the, his stories are so complicated, I'm going to have to talk for hours to explain what's going on here. But basically, uh, at some point in the story, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, you will be soon, I hope, you know, Matt has this sort of transformative experience in this other world with these, these ancient creatures, um, at which point he makes uh, sort of a bargain unbeknownst to himself and uh, finds himself hanging you know, by the neck uh, from this ancient tree that's in this uh, ruined city in the middle of the desert. Uh, and that's sort of the, you know, the turning point for his character as far as I, as far as I thought. So, um, so he's standing in front of the Tree of Life, uh, 
with this weapon that he just sort of was gifted um, by these creatures. It's a, I guess it's a little bit like a glaive or a Japanese naginata or something. It's a quarterstaff with a sword blade um, attached to the end of it, which I thought as a child was totally badass. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and then the ravens are, uh, you know, they mark uh, they mark his weapon, um, and the ravens become sort of an important symbol as he progresses throughout the series. You know, eventually he is. Uh, it's the Prince of Ravens, right, is, is what he becomes uh, towards the end later on in the series. So I thought the Ravens were a great symbol, and, and graphically they're these you know, neat sort of frenetic black shapes that you can uh, use to keep the composition interesting. Um, and then two, there's always there's this discussion now, you know, whether Matt is sort of Jordan's homage to Odin, you know, with the two, with the spear that never misses, and the two Ravens with memory and thought. Um, and so uh, I thought, what the hell, you know, let's really try to reference that little I think, I think, like any fan, I'm really just looking forward to some sort of conclusion and receiving a, a few answers. You know, I'm not, I'm not expecting to have everything answered, and in fact, I hope that there's going to be some, some mystery left.